Well, amazingly enough, these are our last three required works, and this is your last regular lecture. The disembodied voice won't shut up just yet. You still have a test review lecture for this unit and some course review lectures. And then I'll show up in person for our final review. Still, this is a big deal. We have almost made it. These last three artists and their works have certain elements in common. What do you think they might be? These artists are all of African descent. Yinka Shonabari was born in London to Nigerian parents, grew up in Nigeria, returned to Britain for art school, and stayed. In 2005, he was named a member of the Order of the British Empire, which makes him Sir Yinka Shonabari. A little ironic, given the anti-colonial theme of his works. Julie Moreta was born in Ethiopia to an Ethiopian father and an American mother, but her family fled to America when she was a child, and she has lived and worked in the United States ever since. El Anatsui was born in Ghana, but has lived in Nigeria most of his life, teaching at the University of Nigeria, Nsuka. What about common themes? Despite their physical dissimilarity, what content do these works share? I would argue that all three works in different ways address globalization. These artists are global citizens whose work is informed both by their African heritage and by a global art world that brings artists from around the world and art patrons from around the world together at various biennales and museum exhibits. Moreover, all three artists explore the way cultural and economic exchange has changed people's lives. Shonabari's French aristocrats wear cloth made from Indonesian patterns produced in British and Dutch factories and sold to West African markets, where Dutch wax cloth became identified as a distinctly African art. Moreto's abstract stadium seemed to fly flags of many countries and include symbols that suggest global telecommunications and exchange. El Anatsui's abstract patterns echo Ghanaian kenti cloth, but they are also made of flattened liquor bottle labels and tops, a one-time European import, that is alcohol, that wreaked havoc on many African lives. So, while their work implicitly condemns colonialism, it also, perhaps ironically, celebrates the exchange that colonialism in some ways made possible. So now let's take our last three works one by one. Clearly, Shonabari's work is an homage to Fragonard's. What's different about the two works? No reason not to start with the obvious. Shonabari's installation is three-dimensional. It's installed to give us the same view, essentially, as our view of Fragonard's playful lady when we're standing in front of it. That is, we look right up her skirts. But viewers can also walk around Shonabari's swinging lady and put themselves in the place of one of the two figures missing from the installation the man pushing the girl on the swing, and the lover hiding in the bushes. Once again, the viewer becomes a participant, maybe even a guilty party. Think of our shadows as they hit Kara Walker's silhouettes. And then there's the cloth. We've already talked about that and the themes of globalization, colonialism, and cultural appropriation that Dutch wax cloth suggest. So what about the missing head? Well, it turns out that Missing Head may not have just been a shout-out to the French Revolution. When I did more research into this artist's work, I discovered that many of Shonabari's figures are missing heads. Note that in this installation, the European statesmen sitting around the table dividing up Africa are also wearing Dutch wax cloth. By the way, this really happened at the Congress of Berlin in 1884. Next year's AP World History students, stay tuned. Here's still another work appropriating a Rococo painting, and here's the original, also a frog in art. Something I hadn't picked up on earlier is that Shonabari is disabled. At the age of 18, he contracted transverse myelitis, an inflammation of the spinal cord, and this left one side of his body paralyzed. Over time, his disability has become more severe, and he now uses an electric wheelchair. Here's what the artist himself has to say. I really liked this. I do have a physical disability, and I was determined that the scope of my creativity should not be restricted purely by my physicality. It would be like an architect choosing to build only what could be physically built by hand. Instead, Shonabari relies on a team of assistants to realize his artistic vision in a sense that makes him a truly conceptual artist. So let's watch a short video clip that introduces the artist and more of his work. And here's our next work. I'll read a description from the Florida Museum where this work now hangs. Anatsui's old man's cloth is inspired in part by kenti cloth. 
the royal and ceremonial strip woven cloth made by the Asante and Ewe people of Ghana and Togo. Kenti cloth is hand woven into four to eight inch strips that are subsequently cut into smaller pieces and sewn together to form a single cloth with a unique geometrical pattern. Color and design convey specific meanings. Anatsui uses a similar process. However, the fragments that constitute his work are the flattened labels and tops of recycled liquor bottles created by Nigerian distilleries. And here's an example of Kenti cloth. In the Santi legend, Anansi the spider taught the people to weave this cloth and return for a few favors. My kids always loved Ashanti the spider stories. Oops. And now we see the king of the Asante dressed in Kenti cloth and sitting on the golden stool. Something I find intriguing about this work is that it appears differently depending on how it's hung, so the museum curators actually play a role in creating the work of art. I also find the use of recycled materials intriguing. Where else have we seen this? Michael Tafri's Pisupo Lua Afe is made from flattened corned beef cans, right? I'm going to let the artist do most of the talking here. In this brief clip, El Antsui talks about why he uses liquor caps in his work. Old man's cloth is also a work where the medium is very important to the part of the message or content. So let's watch another video clip, this time about the artist studio near the University of Nigeria in Suka. Before I move on to our last work, hooray, let me share some information about from the style section of the New York Times about these works. An Anatsui insists that his hangings be draped rather than hung flat, but he doesn't insist on dra draping them himself, and in fact is perfectly happy to have galleries or museums do so. He has preferences. Horizontal ripples are better than vertical ones, but he doesn't regard any particular arrangement as final. Naturally, professional curators are disconcerted by this freedom. Anatsui has little patience with their scruples. Museum people are trained not to be creative, Anatsui complains. I find that very frustrating. I realize I've quoted a lot of reviews in this unit, but I'm going to do it again. This comes from an art critic writing in the Raleigh-Durham Indie Week magazine, describing Stadia 1, 2, and 3 as a triptych composed of three staggeringly complex and engulfing works. These huge canvases explode with stylized renderings of stadium architecture and overlays of international emblems, flags, and corporate logos. The piece pulses with color in a brilliant antagonism, a massive diagram that lays bare the conquest of ideological and corporate brand loyalty on a global scale. Here, the sports metaphor is milked for every possible association. War, power, competition, advertising, fascism, fanaticism, pageantry, media, and so on. Woo. Of course, the slide can't begin to capture the scale of these works, which are enormous, but at least here you see all three parts of the triptych. One of the artist's best-known works is a gigantic, that is 80 by 23 foot, mural that she made for the entry lobby of the financial firm of Goldman Sachs in New York City. When asked about whether she felt hesitant about creating the work for one of the great movers and shakers of global capitalism, Moretu responded, I don't see it as an evil institution, but as part of the larger system we all participate in. And anyway, for me it was about making something. It was about the art. Profitable art, by the way. Goldman Sachs paid $5 million for the work. Let's watch a short clip that shows her painting and installing this mural and talking about how her works should affect the viewer both when seen from a distance and from close up. Julie Moretu's father is a professor of cultural geography, actually my alma mater, uh, Michigan State, and a fascination with maps, architectural drawings, and the proliferation of cultural symbols permeates his daughter's work, as this mural makes a little clearer than Stadia II does. So here's another comment from the same reviewer I just quoted. Moreto's influence on his daughter shines through her work in its manifold themes of global migration, societal upheaval, shifting economies, and manifestations of corporate, political, and military power seen through the organizing principle of mapping systems. By the way, do you remember what other artist was influenced by her scientist father? Rachel Royce's father was a renowned botanist. 
Okay, it's not really over until you take the exam, but let's stop for a moment to celebrate crossing at least one finish line.